Hello and welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. And today we're joined again by Ed Casagrande and Matt McNeil from the Canadian Down Syndrome Society, who has a wonderful initiative called Project Understood. If you're unfamiliar with Project Understood, we do have an episode where we interviewed them and they discussed all about the project and their collaboration with Google AI and bringing the Down syndrome community to the table and making this AI technology more accessible. And by doing this, technology is going to do what technology is there for. And that is to advance the lives of others and to give supports. And it's really exciting because what it really speaks on is inclusion and a changing world. But today, our conversation takes a more personal turn. We kind of get into a bit of a deeper dive with them personally, kind of talk about their different experiences with Down syndrome. Um, Ed is a father of a daughter with Down syndrome, and Matt is an adult with Down syndrome. So let's get started. Matthew and Ed, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast again today. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Great to be here. Ed, let me start with you. What were your experiences with Down syndrome prior to your daughter's birth? My knowledge was very limited, you know, in my, you know, growing, going into school, there wasn't someone with Down syndrome that was in my school that, so, you know, my only, I guess, looking back, you know, there was uh, one person um, at the church that I went to growing up and, you know, I would see people in, in, in my, in my hometown with Down syndrome you know, that, that's all I knew. And, you know, like I said, there was really no sense of, of the ability. It was more about, oh, that person's not like me. And the turning point for me after having my daughter was going, so every year um, or in the past, the Canadian Down Syndrome Society does a conference every year where people from all over Canada come to, to the conference uh, for over a weekend. And that was, you know, my first conference. I had just joined the board and um, I was actually working the Canadian Down Syndrome Society booth. Like there's a number of booths, kind of like a trade show style format. And I was sitting down with uh, Nick, who's one of the members of the VADA team. Uh, and at the time he would have been early 20s. And, you know, this was really the first time that I actually sat down and, and spoke with someone with Down syndrome who was, who was an adult. And, you know, this is like my daughter, I think she would have been like four months old or five months old. And that, I'll never forget that conversation because what I learned from that conversation, you know, after talking to, to Nick for over an hour is he wants the same things as anybody else. We, you know, we talked yeah. about music. You know, we talked about girls and, you know, he talked about wanting to move out and get married and have a girlfriend and, and, you know, getting close to a girl and, and all those kind of things. And it was like, what, that was a typical conversation with, I could have had with any 22 year old or however, however old he was there. So to me, that really just opened, opened my mind to say, you know what, similar to a typical person. Nick, in that case, wants, has the same hopes, wants, and dreams as anyone else. And, you know, even spending lots of time with Matt over the past year with, with, uh, with Project Understood, you know, it was very same same feeling in terms of, you know, Matt wants a paycheck, he wants to pay taxes, he wants to live on his own, he wants to have relationships. It's, it's the same as anybody else. Matt, first of all, I, I love as a parent, and I'm going to come more away from the technology side as the parent side of, of our podcast, because 
I have a lot of questions myself whenever I'm watching uh, just with all the changes that are going on. And I just, I want to say that I, I love that you're out there and people are seeing Ed, as you said, Matt has a job and he's had it for 12 years and Matt rides his bike to work. And I, you know, some of my frustration as a parent sometimes will be that this is a surprise to people. Um, and that can be, I can't, I can't imagine your experience, Matt, if every time I did something, people were blown away by it. So that's my question. If, you know, if you could talk a little bit more on your experience, even when you were younger and, and went to school, because I know things have changed since, since you were, you know, in elementary school or middle school or high school. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I personally find it very interesting. Yeah. So now I remember that the different things that I did when I was in elementary school, I met the glasses friends when I was a kid. Um, stuff that I learned that I didn't learn now is trust math, like doing math and stuff. When I was a kid, my, dad, my mom and my stepdad and them taught me how to do dot math. And knew my, nobody knew what that meant. So when I did the dot math, in class, and they saw me what I was doing, they looked at me saying, what the heck are you doing? And I said, I'm doing dot math. And at the end of that, they told me that he teach us that. And at that point, they were so surprised that another way to do math is that way. So I made a great friend for doing that. And the other friends now come up to me and said, Matt, thank you for changing my life. You really helped me a lot when you were a kid. Don't change yourself. And that's where I come from now. To tell them that do not estimate who people are and stuff like that when you were kids. Yeah, that that's a great example where, you know, Matt just needed to be taught a little bit differently uh, to, you know, to adapt to the way Matt learns and of course you know he was able to to learn so it's it's having that awareness that you know as I mentioned you know people some people may need you know may need to be taught in a different manner or using a different resource or more visuals than words I'm just making up examples yeah. but it's it's we need to kind of think beyond there's only one way of of, of doing things and, and speaking of school like even Matt he went to college and he lived yep. in residence. So again, when I when I found that out, you know, as you mentioned, Lori, it's like, wow, you know, when I, when I hear things like that, it's like, okay, well, then my daughter, should, maybe my daughter can do that. You know, maybe my daughter can can live on her own and 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 go hop on her bike to check work work schedule and 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 go to school. So it's just very very comforting to see that, and that's you know one of the roles of, of, of the VADA community that I spoke about before where Matt sits on. It, it's to give inspiration to especially those new parents who, you know, they're they're going through lots in their head in terms of what the future will hold and what, you know, what will you know what what what's gonna come out of all this. And seeing those real life examples, it, it's it's very motivating. And and I, again going back to that first conference that I went to um, when my daughter was 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 four months old at the time we only had two kids but seeing families where you know you know that had people with down syndrome and, and typical people and interacting and siblings and sibling rivalry it's all the same like it, you know whether whether you have down syndrome or not you're going to be happy sad you're going to fight with your brother and sister you're going to you know want to watch something on tv so seeing that interaction was like okay it's just we're going to be just like any other family and uh you know, we'll turn out okay. So it's just, but we need to continue to raise awareness on the abilities and what someone with Down syndrome can do versus what they can't do so that we were ones to help raise the bar and, and achieve those, those larger milestones. Because it's not that long ago where <laughs> the bar was very, very low. So we all can appreciate that bar has risen and there's lots of opportunity for it to go even higher. 
I think what is so great about seeing these examples, because I know that when my son was born, there weren't a lot of examples. I don't even think, no, I'll take that back. There were really no examples out there because I went and I did research and there was nothing very hopeful. And I think what having these examples to where more people see the capabilities and the changes, I think it's more the change of perception than, than the abilities, because I believe that the abilities were always there. It's just how they were limited in society. I think that takes away a lot of the fear. And, and what I experienced as a, a new parent was not, not only just the fear of being a new parent, like I was with my daughter, but there was so much unknown. And the only known was stuff that really kind of put fear in, in our hearts because it was limits. And I, and I love that, you know, that's one thing I said to my husband when Liam was born is just like Sophia will go to college if she chooses, Liam's going to go to college if that's what he wants to do. But it wasn't a norm that was out there. It was something that, you, you weren't given that you it was almost like I was stomping my foot in the ground and it shouldn't be that way no even for me when when Lori would say that I, I went oh okay I mean but did I really believe it not initially because I was brought up to think of someone with Down syndrome as limited I wasn't <laughs> Lori was not so she really has brought this great positive attitude that is only gonna you know if you if we told our typical daughter that you're not going to college because she couldn't because she'd be unable to do it, then right there I'm limiting her, and she may not go to college for that very reason. So having these positive attitudes and telling everyone what they can do, just like how you said, Matt, what can you do, not what you can't do, that's going to really make everybody rise to that that higher bar that you talked about, Ed. Yeah, and, I, and it just goes back to, and again, this applies to uh, everyone, is just, you know, not shutting the door on people and, and, and creating those opportunities where doors are open so that, you know, someone has the opportunity to, to see what's on that, you know, on the other side of the door there, you know, going back to, you know, how I think about the future all the time, I'm hopeful as well, you know, and I, you know, Liam, you said Liam is 10 years old. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, my daughter Emma is six. So they're going to go through school you know, for the most part, very inclusive classrooms and, and they're going to be surrounded by peers and, and their classmates and friends who, you know, I'm hopeful that they see Emma as Emma and not, you know, Emma the Down Syndrome kid. But those classmates, those friends who are very young right now, they're our future leaders. They're the future bosses. They're the future HR departments. And I'm hopeful that to them, it, it isn't, it will not be a great leap I'm hoping it happens much sooner than than, than that, but it's it, it's not a big leap to to be diverse and to be inclusive, you know, beyond school and especially when it comes to work, because I think you know there's lots of opportunity there. I think you know today a lot of companies feel that yes, you know, we need diversity not only from you know um, physical, um, but you know just all all walks of life. But I think a lot of people are held up on the how, how to do it, you know, what supports are in place to, to get that done. So I'm hopeful that we will overcome that. But, uh, you know, that's a huge area that, you know, I'd like to like to see some some progress made on. Agreed. And I think that's the that's the whole advocacy for inclusion is because it does start at the foundation of having having society just be inclusive. So everything is accept just you just accepted you're just it's just there and let's start from that even playing field as we are who we are and everybody is different and everyone has something to contribute right matt can i ask you when you were in school did you uh, attend in an inclusive classroom in high school yes many times i uh took everyday life math and that taught me a lot of stuff that i didn't know like now i do now but I took stuff that I didn't know I can do before, but when I did, I loved it. How did you feel going into the inclusive classroom, or how were you accepted then? What was that experience? Maybe because my fifth group had friends that knew, knew me. Maybe that's one of the reasons why, but, but then sports was, was when I was thriving in because I wanted to make a change, so I started to work for student council. And I did one little award that made everybody thought 
who was that on the microphone? And so I said, my speech, so I said, I might be different, but I could make a difference. And last thing I know it, everybody in the school said, wow, that's Matthew? Like, I made my day. And then I made the student council that way. Because of them seeing behind my abilities and see the person for. I hope you don't mind if I steal that motto. Uh, I might be different, but I can make a difference. That's fantastic. <laughs> we got to copyright that one. Trademark it. Make a t-shirt. Right. Uh, Matt, what, what college did you go to? I'm so, I'm sending college in Peterborough. Peterborough, Peter. Ontario, which is about, oh. Two hours away from Toronto. Yeah, two hours east of Toronto, Ontario. And and what did you study in college? So, in that um, class, they had a, a class for CICE, Co-op Integrated Through Co-op Education. So I was going for uh, Rec and Regional, so Rec. Oh, Rec, yeah. And that's, so like, you know, Matt's college, like that's, from his house, that'd be like four hours away. So we're not talking like right around the corner from, from the parents' house where they can check out on Matt. He was, he was uh, far away, and he got it done. Living on campus, right? Living on campus, going into bus routes. Can I ask a little bit about your experience going into going into the classroom? How you um, in college? Yeah, in college. I'll let I'll let you talk on what that experience was like when you first went. My first experience going into the classroom that uh, I didn't know anybody, so uh, I just went in as a student and sit down, listen to the teacher. If somebody came and talked to me, I talked to them. Um, signed up for like bus buddies. So if somebody in there who was my bus buddy would be there to talk to. And they would show me what friends to talk to and be in the right path of who I talked to to get help for homework and stuff. What was the what was the reception? Were teachers surprised or were some of your classmates surprised that you were there or about your abilities? Yeah, exactly. Some of the classes I took, um, I was talking about Down syndrome for my classmates. And uh, first, I was kind of telling myself that I can talk to the classmates and tell them what Down syndrome really is. And uh, I was happy that I could give them good information what Down syndrome was. And exactly, I had a friend who kind of helped me with the project. And I was happy because it really turned out as a uh, great project at the end of the day. Matt has a very engaging personality, as you can probably tell, and, and uh, you know, he's easy to talk with. He, you know, he, he can joke around like the best of them, and like I said, he's a big sports fan. You know, don't get him started on the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team. So, like, you know, Matt, it's, it's easy to have a conversation with Matt, so I can only... I haven't. I wasn't there when when Matt went to college, but I can just only assume, based on how I know what I know about Matt and how I how I know Matt, that you know he would have no problem talking with people, interacting, and, and making lots of friends. So I can, you know, when he when he talks about you know breaking down some barriers, I can see that those barriers going down very early in, in his when he went to college, and you know they saw Matt as Matt versus something else. So I took a project because I was asking to do a uh, an essay. So I said to myself, I would like to compare Down syndrome stereotypes and Aboriginal stereotypes. And I wrote into a good um, essay and uh, I turned it in. And she was like, that's amazing. So I got an 85 because of that uh, essay. I turned that into a blog for the Canadian Down syndrome. Oh, that's fantastic. I'd love to get a link to your blog. I do, I would put that on, on the show notes if anyone wants to read that. And going back to Project Understood, this technology will help people blog as well. Of course. We always like to ask a question to our guests. Uh, the podcast is called If We Knew Then, and it's it's from a parent's perspective usually. Um, just usually it's it's I wouldn't have worried so much in the past if I had known things, and that's probably universal in any in any capacity or any subject that you, you could talk about, any experience you can have. But maybe I can direct this to Ed first. Would you have an if you knew then statement to make? Yeah, a good, good question. Uh, if I knew then, well, things are going to be okay. 
Isn't that fun? funny how um, at the beginning of a journey, you uh, have all these questions and the unknown, and it's just human behavior possibly, and also just the information we have. The unknown's sometimes so scary, and when you have sometimes negative input or negative information that you get to, your mind even expands that and makes it where you're really fearful. And I believe that all this positive positive things that we're putting out that the project is putting out is really going to change the initial thoughts uh, for parents in particularly when they find out they're going to have a child with Down syndrome. Yeah. And in fact, you know, that was really the first campaign we did you know, three or four years ago called Down Syndrome Answers, where, you know, I can go through my experience, which is very similar with a lot of people is, you know, once you find out whether, you know, uh, prenatal or at birth, you know, it's just, it hits you like a brick wall because you didn't expect it. And then what do you do? You go online and you search for answers and you get a wide range of information and, you know, some of it, a lot of it focuses on the limitations versus the potential. And so we created a campaign called Down Syndrome Answers where we actually looked at, you know, what are the most asked questions on Google when it comes to Down Syndrome? You know, how long does a person with Down Syndrome live? Can someone with Down Syndrome ride a bike, drink alcohol? A number of questions. And what we did is have people with Down Syndrome record answers to those questions. So not only we're trying to you know, squash some myths and stereotypes, but seeing and hearing the answer said by someone with Down syndrome obviously puts a a human aspect to it. And, you know, going back to what I said, you know, things will be okay. Seeing in that context, you know, it's not a cold piece of paper or a cold piece of text that you're reading and trying to understand, well, how does this apply to me? Seeing someone giving you a, a heartfelt response makes a big difference in, in how you're getting that information. So, yeah, that's that's another campaign you can check out. A lot of these campaigns you can find on the, the Canadian Down Syndrome Society website, uh, cdss.ca. I'll look that up, and if, if, I, if I do have a problem getting it, I'll, I'll make sure I get the link from you because that's, that's definitely something we'd love to promote. Matt, do you have an If You Knew Then? Were there, were there times, Matt, where you maybe, when you were younger, you felt that, oh, I can't do this? That's a very good question. Public speaking was the toughest thing I ever done. When I kept going, like, back then, I didn't know, know how to do public speaking. And now, look at me right now. So, I think public speaking helps me now. And that, that if I could think that then that how I can speak clearly enough to talk to people. And you were, you were a little nervous when you first started public speaking? Yes. I think everyone is. That's one of the, the scariest things you can do, you know, list, <laughs> listed under, like, being a fighter pilot trying to land a plane on an aircraft carrier. That can be really nerve-wracking. Yep. What helped you with your public speaking? Well, technology, the one thing that helped me with my uh, speaking, because as you guys know now, I'm mumbling, but so I had to figure out a good answer to answer the questions and speed up my answers. So those kind of things that helped me to calm down and think before I say stuff. And I think the more the more speaking engagement you have, Matt, the better you get at it. So yeah. you know, with your with your work with Vada and, you know, you're oftentimes even you know, going back to some of those conferences, you're you're up on the stage with a microphone or you're you're leading a, a discussion with your peers. So I think you've, because you've had so many opportunities to speak, you know, you're much better at it, just like, yeah. you know, anyone else. It's all about repetition. Matt, can I ask you, you know, Liam, he's cognitively there as far as speaking, but his expressive language is, comes in a little bit slower and we work on that and we assist him with speech. As a parent talking to you who, you, you speak very eloquently, and I love, I love to listen to you talk. Um, can you tell me, as far as advice, something that helped you with speaking? Is there an app, or is there a book, or is there something that you use that that help you to develop your speech? The thing that helps me with is my mind. Really, it does know yourself. So it would take time, but I believe 
that uh, it would take patience, really, to keep what you're doing. And I feel that at the end of the year, go in the future, I feel like I'd be a great person to talk to. Mm-hmm. Was it frustrating for you as your speech was coming in? Yeah. And what what helped with the frustration just as as, uh, you know, just as someone who's I'm supporting my son to develop his speech. What helped you with that frustration? Parents, um, friends all helped me with my speech. A co-worker like Ed helped me talk. Someone who knew what I'm talking about and not finished my sentence. I always say that uh, the always is support out there for speaking. And Ed, those one who always helps me sometimes and the most. So thanks, Ed. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, Matt's not afraid to to speak his mind, so we just have to give people like Matt the opportunity to speak and to be heard and to stop and listen. And you know, not cutting off or not trying to say what you think Matt wants to say. Matt knows what he wants to say. Let him say it. So it's just If I mess up, I mess up. You can always say it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're glad we were able to bring you guys together and, and have you guys talk to each other a little bit. I know you, you guys don't live next door to each other, obviously. Yeah, we're about an hour and a half away. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with this Project Understood campaign, I was very adamant. To, uh, you know, we needed Matt to be a big part of this. And I'm just very happy the way everything turned out. Ed, um, your journey with your daughter over the last six years is there anything that you you'd like to share, or whether it be personal or just a, a, you know? I'm I'm very 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 hopeful for the future. Like I've I've seen how my daughter thrives in school and in social settings, and you know the thing that she does. Like you know I don't see Emma as someone down syndrome. I just see Emma as Emma, and you know I'm I'm not. Well, I, you know there are things that. I still think about about the future. I'm not. I'm not fearful. I'm, uh, and you know, maybe I'm naive, but I think things are going to. You know, we're at a time. We're in a big, big time in, in society. And again, it just it goes back to you know, just beyond Down syndrome, where I think there's going to be some big changes, and we're just on the on the tipping point. And and so I'm very, I'm less scared. I'm not going to keep my guard down, but I'm less scared. Yeah, I don't think that's naive at all. I, I, I No, we're with you. Ed and Matt, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for joining us on the podcast again. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website, If We Knew Then.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. Amazon.